everybody, and welcome to Randy Sands and the Mediumship Crew. We're glad to have you join us tonight. And tonight, we are going to have Stacy Shurman Kopchinski do a review of the spiritualist pioneer Lenora Piper. Jack, before we get started, would you like to do your job? Wow, you said all that without almost breathing. Yeah. I happy good Facebook people. Woohoo! And with that, let's turn it over to Stacy. Wow, right out of the gate, quick and fast. Boom. Boom. So we're going to talk about Lenora Piper. I do have a picture of a background of her, but I don't know. It didn't work out quite so well, but I'll try to pop it up quick just so you could all see her for a minute. I actually have something else behind you, so see if you can guess what it is as we get started. Oh, there we go. Here she is. Yay! Look Lenora at that hair. Piper. I know. What a fancy lady. Lenora Piper, otherwise known as the Boston Medium. So give it up to Boston Mass. We're going to talk a little bit about her this morning. Or this morning? What time of day I am? What planet am I on? I don't know. But well, you know, it's morning somewhere. It is morning somewhere. Thank you for that. So, <laughs> thanks. Well, you know, she was a trans medium. She just kind of forgot where she was sometimes. So, But she's actually one of the most, probably one of the most studied by scientists and researchers, mediums in the U.S., especially for her time. So let's get some basic facts out of the way with her. Um, she was born June 27th, 1857. Went to the world of spirit on June 3rd, 1950. So this is her month, actually, isn't it? She was a cancer. Yeah. She was, you know, born into a probably lower middle class family. She, you know, as a child, it's always interesting how most mediums of the day have had some sort of childhood experience. Um, she had an episode about when she was seven or eight. I love that they call them episodes. She had an episode when she was out in the yard playing. She heard a voice tell her that her aunt is still with her, but not physically here. She runs into the house, tells her mother, and two days later, they get the telegram that her aunt had passed away. You know, again, we didn't have cell phones back in that day, so it took time to get news to family members. And then, and then again, throughout her teenage years, she's been kind of known to have experiences of voices or faces in her room. But for the most part, she wasn't really part of the spiritualist movement until um, more in her middle ages. She did get married, and she married just a, a, a gentleman who owned a grocery store, was a salesman kind of. And they lived in Boston, again, not necessarily lower class, not high class, just right kind of in the middle. And she had two daughters. And it was there in Boston, when she was probably in her mid-30s, she fell and hit her head on the street. And after that, she had these kind of constantly conflicting you know, physical ailments, headaches, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And she would go see doctors. She would kind of faint or have dizzy spells, those kinds of things. Very, very non-flamboyant woman. Very calm, peaceful, graceful, plain. Like a lot of people would call her plain or described her as plain. And she was just having these terrible little physical ailments. And so somehow, I think it was her father convinced her to go see a psychic doctor at the time. Again, I think we're talking like 1859, you know, and she goes and sees, I think his name's Crook, don't hold me to it, um, but it's like something Crook. She goes and sees him, doesn't really get anything the first visit, so she decides to go back for the second visit, and as soon as he places his hand on her head, she falls into a deep sleep and then starts talking. Other voices start coming out of her mouth. So she falls into a trance-like sleep almost immediately. And so from there, she started to develop mediumship. Again, you're talking this great, you know, eight, late 1800s. 
the the spiritualist movement is crossing all states and boundaries and is like i think at one time was like the third largest religion in the u.s like at that time so so mediumship you know she started developing her mediumship she just kind of trusted what was coming trusted what was happening and she would have sittings in her home now interesting enough she was really kind of the most i don't know what to call it shyest medium of the time you know most times when people would enter into homes they had the cabinet they had the red lighting they all sat in circles that was really not her setup her setup was like here's my parlor there's like you know sit anywhere you like N you know no dark no cabinet no lights no nothing she would just sit there and she'd say well it may happen and it may not happen <laughs> she's very like here it is you know you're gonna come you're gonna you know and she she actually developed her trance which is a form of mediumship she she developed trance first and originally when she started going into a state of trance especially back then um most and even now actually when you if you study trance now with a good trance medium you'll find that most of them have like a spirit team or people in the spirit world that are their controls not like they are not in control of their body but like their team their helpers you know it's not like they just anybody comes through and speaks there's you know order just like there's order here and she her first guide or control was named chlorine what a weird name hey chlorine what an odd name but it was like a little girl and um she didn't really stay very long she was there just for a few few you know a few sittings and then it was dr finney which was kind of her main control for now you got to remember she's practicing this mediumship for like 40 years okay so you know the first couple years when she was just getting started and then and then dr finney came in and he stayed with her again from the spirit side of life not like a real like human that came to you know spirit side of life when her husband passed she started doing more circles inside of her home and how it was actually kind of interesting so back to what i was saying she goes into trance kind of just in her parlor and while she's in a state of trance she she claims she can't remember anything right she claims that some people again to each their own everyone does mediumship differently but she claimed not to remember anything that happened during and we're going to get into some weird stuff that this poor woman had to go through. So she went into a very deep like sleep. Dr. Finney would come in and say information to the sitters in the room that were just unbelievably accurate to the point of names, dates, diseases, uh, relationships, passings, like your family secrets, right? Like just kind of coming out. And there were two women at one time that were sitting in her circle and they kept going back because it was very accurate. One of the sisters or one of the women, oh, one of the women was sisters to uh, Professor William James, who was a Harvard, you know, the University of Harvard professor. Um, and he was intrigued in the spiritualist movement at the time. And so he went, uh, you know, undercover to kind of see what she was producing. And while she was under the trance state, she was able to, like, tell him the name of a child they lost a year beforehand, tell him the name of the, her, you know, his father-in-law or something that passed his spirit. Again, a lot of accuracy, and that kind of got him hooked. Like, wait a minute, how can this woman know this? So he approached her and basically said, um, "Can can I st can I study you?" There's a there's a good question to ask somebody, right? Can I study you? Um, so at, and also at this time, there was a British psychic research group happening. There was an American psychic research group happening. He actually formed the American branch of the British branch of psychic research. And so he, I mean, and when I say they tested, they tested um, mediums, like 
just tremendous testing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But we test them so much and they really kind of debunked a lot of mediums at the time. But with her, she didn't have all of this grandioso show. You know, it was just her in her sitting parlor. And so they would send, well, let's see. When she agreed to be tested, because again, she just felt like she fell asleep. And I'm actually just quickly looking for a quote because they, there's actually a book about to come out about her. Actually, it's, So if anybody's interested in reading, um, you could read it. But she says, so here's, here, these are her own words. She describes her experiences as follows. I feel as if something were passing over my brain, making it numb. A sensation uh, similar to that that I experienced when I was etherized. Only an unpleasant of odor of ether is absent. I feel a little cold, not very, just a little, as if a cold breeze passed over me. And the people and objects become smaller until they finally disappear. Then I know nothing more until I wake up. When the first thing I am conscious of is a bright, very, very bright light, and then darkness, such darkness. My hands and my arms begin to tingle just as one foot tingles after it's been asleep, and I see, as if from a great distance, objects and people in the room, but they are small and very black. So she would literally just go into this deep state of trance. They actually had to put pillows on the table or the floor around her because a lot of times she would fall over. <laughs> Just poor, this poor woman. Like, can you imagine waking up with like a goose egg on your head? Just, she just fall over. So they set her up with pillows. So she, she I want to talk a little bit about Dr. F Dr. Finney, the first control of Lenora Piper. Um, because he's the one who really shows up. So, you know, these days when you see a lot of mental mediumship where like a medium brings somebody a message and that medium is pretty aware, you know, it's the filter, it's the medium in the middle between the two two worlds, you know, kind of bringing. This is, this is really different because she literally is in a sleep-like state. So she's, she's in a trance, what we call trance state. And her voice and her demeanor would transform to almost like she was another person. Now, don't we, yeah. I think Tammy wants to ask. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Thanks for that. I didn't see that. Stacy, from her description, though, it sounds more of that she does a out of body, you know, almost like she exits her body and views it from outside why another spirit is, you know, in charge. So you can see where it would be easy for her to say that she's not aware because she actually steps outside. Yeah. And with permission, you know, like it's interesting because when you when you really I mean, I would suggest that you study trans mediums because all trans mediums, some feel like, nope, I'm in the body. I'm aware of what's going on. And other trans mediums like her, like you said, kind of go into this state. Now they're not. And the thing is, is I don't want anyone to get the misconception that she's being controlled. She is absolutely partaking in this. Do you know, she, she's not forced mm -hmm. to be knocked out. You know, like she's saying, no, I'm willing, I'm able, I want to work, you know, and that's what she did. So even though we use control or like Tammy said, that out of body, it's not that she's not there, you know, or being right. controlled or possessed. So that's good to know. But yeah, I think you're right, Tammy. It's fascinating that a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, and especially she started behind me on the screen, and we'll talk more in depth in this in a little bit. She actually started as she developed her trance and as she developed, and the spirit team developed their, you know, co-creating with her. She actually would start doing automatic writing too. So if you can imagine, she's talking, sometimes, like I just said, not her own voice. Like it can be a distinct male's voice. You know, here this woman is quiet, shy, shy, graceful, ordinary, plain and ordinary for the time. Nothing would stand out about her. And then all of a sudden she'd have this deep male voice coming from her mouth. 
you know, resonating and, and talking, you know, to the people that were in the room and knew, I don't know how many accounts have been written. I mean, I've read millions of accounts. She, because she's the most studied, there are tons of papers on her. Like you can read all types of, you know, sittings. I think it's said that she sat almost over 4,000 times um, in, in test subjects. that trip in a minute and probably like 400 just in one year you know um oh it says my internet's unstable i hope i don't lose you guys i get lenora like get her good vibes and get my internet working <laughs> but you know um yeah tammy you're absolutely right it's it's amazing you know and to witness if you can really witness true trance you feel it in the room like you literally feel the energetic shift in the room as spirit comes close. So she would, and, and when William James, he first started, right? He, he actually pawned off a lot of the research on the secretary, and I can't remember his name, um, of, of the group, of the American researchers. And they would go so far as to give fake names, right? So they would just say, okay, we're, we're sending five five men over they're all they're all their names are tom <laughs> you know this is tom pete larry dick and harry you know like here they are with not even real names and they would sit and she would and she would go into trance and her controls would be like and larry that's not your name but your aunt is passing or just passed or your uncle george just passed and sure enough, they get home and there's a telegraph there. Like just so accuracy. Now, the big thing about the, the group of scientists is they were trying to decide if this was telepathy, if this was PSK, or if it was mediumship. And really, it's interesting because some of the scientists believe some of it was telepathy they believe that Dr. Finney might have been an alter ego of, of her, of Mrs. Piper, doing PSK. But even the PSK was, like, phenomenal. Like, her psychic ability was, like, it didn't matter if it came from her subconscious mind or from spirit of Dr. Finney. It didn't matter because her accuracy was what was just unbelievable. But the reason they couldn't decipher her as either psychic or medium was because a lot of her automatic writing. So it's interesting, Dr. Finney stayed her control for quite a few years. And at one point they send her over to Britain, over to England to get studied by the British Society. Hayward, Carrington, there's a bunch of names, but one of the most common ones is Sir Oliver Lodge. Most of you have heard of him. He's a big scientific researcher in the in the field of mediumship and so they sent her over on a boat and they won't let her leave her room she can't talk to anybody on the boat just in case one of those people would give her information then they went so far as to remove all the personal belongings from his house all pictures all photographs all letters they they he he kind of like laid off his regular servants and hired all new servants that knew nothing about him, his family, or any of his researchers. And then when she got there, she could only stay in the bedroom. She couldn't wander the ground. She couldn't go anywhere. She had to stay in the bedroom. And then again, night after night, dozens of people coming in, all with fake names, you know, to test her ability. And what was interesting is, is one of the gentlemen that came in, I'm just going to pull his name up so I have it, but one of the gentlemen who came in to this, you know, seance in England, here's some of the things that Oliver Lodge, Sir Oliver Lodge, actually required, right? So they actually had detectives, private detectives follow her from the U.S. to England and also follow the sitters to make sure that they weren't talking amongst each other or sending her. 
any correspondence she received or the sitters received had to have been looked at. They changed all servants. They removed all family diaries and photographs. They actually searched the house every night picking locks to make sure that each bedroom contained no one in it. They examined not only her correspondence, but her outfit, her what she wore every day, which, you know, to me, I don't understand why would you look at what she's wearing. She could have no servants help her because they, they didn't want any information to pass between, like, in small talk. Um, again, gave them all assumed names, and they ref and they could have no small talk within her presence. So literally, she came from the bedroom to the sitting room, went into trance, and was removed before any of the sitters were removed. So she could never hear any conversation. Can you imagine she did that, like, I don't know, for like two weeks? Could you even imagine? I'm like, um, I get... I get the idea to test for science, but at some point, stuff gets ridiculous, right? And even more so, she, another bad thing, I'm just going to digress for a minute. Another thing that happened to her a lot too, again, she went into this deep state of trance. And like she, like she said, like she described it, she didn't even feel her body. They would make her smell like chlorine. They would literally put it in her mouth or allow her to sniff it to see if it would even jar her out of her trance. And it never did. Like they had, they were putting all kinds of smelling salts, things under her nose, making sure she inhaled it. So, so they knew, and she would never, she would never change from her position until the seance was done. She would wake up with blisters in her mouth because of things that they put in her body. And, you know, and, and she did this for what? You know, really for us. Like, I really, I have to say that. Like, I, I don't know why, you know, why go through, I mean, because it really started, she went through this for almost 30 years. You know, and she was known, you know, obviously known as one of the most studied mediums and the most accurate medium. But it's crazy. So in this in this sitting over in England, she's sitting there, and of course, you know, they send in the fake, you know, the fake names. And in England, because they're closer to Paris, which this this Dr. Finney was claiming to be a, a, a French medical doctor, but yet he couldn't necessarily speak French, and he couldn't um and he couldn't necessarily like diagnose or new medical things. Again, Shamil Shamagal, it's the words he's getting right. Like he's bringing in all of this information, like lost keys, describing where they're, you know, where he could find them. You know, one of the, one of the skeptics had lost a set of keys up in the, you know, up in the mountains and he was able to tell him where to go find it. And sure enough, he went and found it and it was right where, right where Dr. Finney said, but again, trained men scientists to kind of pick everything apart, pick everything apart. And so there was this, there was this gentleman named George Plu. That was actually his real name, okay? And he actually was, um, he actually started to study in Harvard, met William James. And William James says, I want you to go to this circle, but we're going to give you the name George Pelham because he wanted a different name you know, to identify with. Now, George Pelham was an atheist, did not believe in anything really, but of course science and thought most mediums were frauds, fake charlatans type of thing. So he goes, nothing really spectacular happens necessarily at that seance because that's the other thing I find so lovely about her is if nothing came, nothing came. She's like, well, thanks for coming. Not tonight. Sorry. You know, not that, well, but you know, you don't see that. You see, you see mediums try to push through and try to do something when they should just say, you know, I ain't got nothing. Spirit's not here tonight for whatever reason. So, or I'm not right for spirit tonight, whatever reason. So nothing really like, like really great happens at this, at this, um, at this seance. However, two days later, this George Pelham dies 
<laughs> like he goes he just ups and dies for no like an accident, some freak accident. Well, he actually became her control for a couple years afterwards. So Dr. Finney kind of went back and stepped back and in comes this atheist that was working with William James. And so there was even some more fantastic conversation about that. But what's interesting is the writing. I want to get to the writing behind me and then I'll kind of talk about how, how her, the rest of her life kind of ended. But so she would also talk, like the, the control would talk, talk to people in the room. But then it's been known that at both times her right and left hands would be writing letters. Hundreds and hundreds of stacks of paper or rolls of paper. And so if you can imagine her controls talking and her hands are moving and they are writing these letters to the people in the room. And what's interesting is, is they're signing them like with their names, like, you know, one could be about botany and the other one is a grandma writing a letter to her granddaughter. Like there was all of this, imag like this fantastic automatic writing. And I know automatic writing is starting to kind of make a comeback in mediumship. So I suggest you kind of look at the difference because there's a little bit of difference. You know, I think a lot of times we, we get inspired to write and there's that flow of consciousness that's coming and we're writing and we're writing, but that's really inspirational writing, you know, like inspiration from spirit, which is a type of mediumship. And then there's this, then there's what's behind me, which is automatic writing, which is, again, you're almost not aware of what you're writing. It tends to be never in your same handwriting. It tends, it can even be different languages. I think we talked about J.V. Mansfeld, didn't we? The postmaster medium at one time. Um, I feel like we had that discussion already, so I don't know. <laughs> I seem to talk about a lot of people, like they're all my friends and family. This is my spiritualist family tree, like, but I'm not related to any of them. But so, but she would write, you know, like, again, it wasn't necessarily her writing. It was controls. At one point she would say it would almost feel like her hands were not necessarily her own. They'd go numb. And so she wasn't even aware that she was writing and, and all of these letters or these books or these papers would come out of all of this information. So talking and writing all with accuracy it just doesn't get any better than that. Like, I just can't even imagine, you know, and, and, and the accuracy that she had. Again, I suggest that you look at a lot of papers. Of course, you're going to find that there are a few people who didn't necessarily say she was a fraud. There was one gentleman who first wrote an article, uh, um, a research paper in 1895 that made her questionable. He said she's, it's questionable about her work. But literally two years later, he actually wrote another article that said, no, um, she's legit. She's legit. So she works with George. So then we have, you know, we had Chlorine at first. Then she moves to Dr. Finney or Dr. Finney comes in. Now we have GP coming in. And eventually GP starts to kind of back off too. And she goes back to more of just a group of people that are trying to kind of talk and work and um, work through her. But at this time, her mediumship is starting to, her health is starting to deteriorate and her, her, um, I, I don't, I don't want to say, you know, just the, the constant work. I mean, again, you have to stay in balance. Like if you're going to work with spirit under that type of, of setting, you know, and get chlorine shoved up your nose and everything else, you have to take care of yourself. So her media, her writing was still spot on, but the, but the trance mediumship was starting to wane. And so finally, you know, it was interesting. She was hot off the press. I mean, everywhere for about 30 years, she was being studied and written about. And all of a sudden, you know, towards that last 20 years of her life, she actually just kind of disappeared. She went back to Boston, lived with her daughter, stopped doing seances, and then passed to spirit well in her 90s, I believe it was, or 80s, I think it might have been. But she just kind of dwindled. But I want to just end, and then we can talk about like automatic writing if any of you guys do it or seen it or trance mediumship. But I want to end with the one quote, um, if I can find it now. Hmm. 
maybe it's here oh right here okay so back to uh professor james again he kind of was the one who kind of took her and and made her the famous medium that she was and he always stood by her and he actually called lenora piper um his white crow uh, believe it or not, was her nickname. And he says, to upset the conclusion that all crows are black, there is no need to seek demonstration that no crows are black. It is sufficient to produce one white crow. A single one is sufficient. And that was his motto for her because of all the mediums that they studied in both the American and the British, you know, psychic societies. They found more frauds and more charlatans, but yet she stood out. She was the one who stood out and and really proved that she was the one white crow, the one truth of mediumship and telepathy. Um, and still to this day, they stand by that with her too. So yeah, pretty cool. Sorry, everybody. I talked a lot. But she's kind of just, and, and I didn't even like touch on her, like really read these papers. It's amazing. It's amazing. The stuff that she predicted she knew, you know, or spirit knew, I guess. And, and just, it just, the information flowed through her and for her to allow herself to be such a clear channel for that proof is just amazing. Any questions? Look at it. It's like they're all silent. At least they're not sleeping. That's always good. I don't see anyone snoring. I think it was very cool. And I can't wait to read more about her. Um, I've had a few inst instances where I've actually trans-channeled spirit. And um, I was aware, but I didn't at the time particularly care for it. For the simple fact of I felt that I was out of control. I felt that they were controlling me, you know, yeah. and just the fact that there, there was no boundaries and that I was just open, you know, and, and it happened, but I've looked more into it and am going to look more into it, um, to doing it more often well and you know tammy to that to that we don't study trans at, or allow trans to develop in the ways that they did back then and i think we need to bring that back people are too wanting instant gratification you know the home circle the sitting every tuesday night at seven by the fire was the safe place for people to develop and experience that connection to spirit. And a lot of times when a person in that circle would start to move into trance, the rest of the circle would act as a battery, as a boundary, as a helper. Not like, well, I want to do that too. Watch me. You know, here I go. <laughs> like, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like this kind of competitive who can get into trance first or, you know, it was this, you know, that's what these circles, that was what that everyday thing was. It was like you developed it and you helped each other develop it. So, right, when somebody slips and doesn't feel safe, wouldn't it be great to have come back to a whole group of people that you are familiar with, that you're comfortable with, that knows that they love you and are supporting you? It would probably help you ease into it. Right better i i always feel that spirit well spirit's in charge spirit moves me along my my mediumship and you know whatever whatever i'm to do i often say i'm the puppet right <laughs> but uh i i feel that once i've gotten to a certain point that spirit says okay this is next and that's why i was to experience that mm -hmm. i also journal and i find that I actually do my readings that way online. I meditate and I write all this information that comes through. And then I send it to them and tell them to get back to me with any questions. And I never get any questions. It's like, it doesn't mean anything to me. I don't understand a word of it. I send it on, you know, 
but evidently it means something to them because they never come back, you know, and say, oh, can you explain this? You know, very, very rarely. Yeah. And, um, and I feel like I step aside, you know what I mean? But not out of body where it sounds like she was more out of body and that there was more control over all of her in order to write with both hands information that isn't even connected to each other yeah you know yeah so and her not being able to feel her hands you know almost like her hands were being guided right but she wasn't feeling it and like I say I feel that she was actually outside of her body and that she was allowing that to happen I but think willingly, willingly, willingly. Well, and that's the thing. I think she worked with her control or her guide or teacher, whatever you want to label it so much that she had such a profound trust with her guide. You know, that's why it's important to work with your guides. You know, I don't know. A lot of people don't teach that part anymore. They think it's, you know, maybe a little bit of an older way, but if you're going to go into that state of letting go if you would or whatever the right, word, step right. aside you know i don't know what the right word would be but mm -hmm. you have to have the complete trust with who's ever like i wouldn't step aside for anyone to come through like who would do that would you let anyone walk through your home like <laughs> no you know but but you have a little circle of friends that you would you know, right. and maybe one in particular has the key, right? You know, like we all have that one person that knows our bank accounts, knows this, knows that, because if anything happens to us, you know. So maybe that's like that type of relationship she had with her, with her, with right. her guides to allow that, that severe uh, or deep or high. Right. Yeah. Interesting. And she lived a very long time. I think she lived in 93. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I feel like she was, you know, she lived, which was actually kind of good because people who tend, you know, all of the, the, the chemicals that they were putting all over her body and in her body, I can't even imagine. And then again, at that time, what torture <laughs> and think about the time. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Do you know how much garment she had to have on just to get dressed in the morning? That wasn't like, oh, let's just slip on our you know, our yoga pants and our t-shirt and let's go out, you know, it was all of these. And then to have to take them all off or have things probed in her to see if, you know, she would respond. It's like, oh, torture. Wow. Amazing. All right. Anyone else have anything? No? It's quiet. It's crickets. All right. Well, then, thank you so much, Stace, for coming in and, and doing that. And um, who's next next month? Do you oh. know? Well, possibly. I'm not sure yet. I can't give all the way the secrets away. We might talk about Edgar Casey just because that's, that could be one um, okay. definitely go in. However, I also just got a new book about a new undiscovered medium. So, well, she's been discovered, but I just discovered her. So Abby Judson. So she's from California. So I'm not sure. Oh yeah. Yet. That's who we got to do. Yeah. Cali <laughs> California girl. I had a request. I have a request for someone. Oh. Who? For Thurman. Who? who? Thurman? Thurman. Oh, Barbara Thurman. Mm -hmm. Is that who you want to talk about? Miss Barbara yeah. Thurman? She was from, yeah. where was she I from? Texas, right? Peter. There's not a lot out there about her. She was an NSAC president. Yeah, she was. I know some people who still knew her. Like that are alive that still knew her or you know know her knew her in the physical. I'm sure there's a lot of people who know her in the spiritual, <laughs> but know her in the physical. I'll have to get some more yeah. information. She's from California too. Yeah, I heard she was one tough cookie. I like them tough. All right. <laughs> well, so we have some choices for next month. Yes, we do. And uh, Jack, you want to do your job? <laughs> 
Are we ready? Yeah. Good night, happy, good Facebook people. <laughs> All right, gang, you want to say good night? Good night. Good night, everybody, and may your week be as amazing as you, and we hope to see you next week or next month when we do the spiritualist review, whatever, and uh, we'll see you then. Bye. Mm -hmm.